Hey, what is up? Welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Lofermento, and we've got an awesome guest today who I love the fact that his business was really inspired by one profound and amazing question that he was once asked that I know he's going to put the pressure on all of us today for us to ask ourselves that question. So I'll let him tell that story, but let me tell you about him. His name is Eric Berglund. Eric is the founder of The Language of Leadership, which is a system he created over nearly a decade of leading sales professionals. Eric grew frustrated with his own inability to hold people accountable only to realize that nearly everyone felt the same way. He spent three years developing the program with his team and then began coaching managers through it in 2020. Eric is passionate about empowering leaders to be more effective with the team they already have, helping them enjoy their jobs more and get their time back. All of us want those outcomes in our own businesses and lives. He lives in Bend, Oregon with his wife and two daughters. They love to ski, rock climb, camp, and adventure together as a family, which immediately tells you something. Eric's tougher than I am. He's got more of a strong tolerance for that cold weather, but I'm excited to tap into his mind today, so I'm not going to say anything else. Let's dive straight into my interview with Eric Berglund. All right, Eric, I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to it and uh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks so much. Heck yeah. I didn't even tease it in the bio. There's so many cool things I could say about you, but you are a fellow young starting entrepreneur as well. You and I both ran our first businesses while we were in college. So I know that you've got an interesting story that backs up your business, but I'm going to let you tell listeners, take us beyond that bio. Who the heck is Eric? How did you start doing all this cool stuff you're into? Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a great segue. I mean, I started cutting my teeth in business actually in high school. I was part of a high school business organization called DECA. It weirdly stands for Distributive Education Clubs of America. And it was a weird high school group that let me learn how to role play. Uh, Where you'd put together these business plans for these mythical or created businesses and you'd go pitch them at local and then state and national competitions. And so I started doing that at 16 years old and it just worked for my brain. I learned that uh, I really enjoyed thinking that way. I really, I, I ran our student store. Just my brain was naturally built for doing things like that, I guess. And then I went to college. <clears throat> I had an opportunity to run a college pro painting franchise. And that was a phenomenal opportunity. If anybody's I got any exposure to college pro, it was a really cool way for college students to paint houses over the summer and to pay other college students to paint houses over the summer for them. And so you learned how to run a business. It was a franchise. So I learned everything about profit and loss and sales and marketing and just everything it takes to be an effective leader. You got to hire people, train them, develop them, build other people in becoming franchise owners. It was a really cool model. And it's what really allowed me to cut my teeth. Learned that I love selling, learned running businesses, all those fun things. I left college pro. Uh, I went into financial advising for a couple of years. That was like a kind of fun path just to learn how to sell stuff. I want to learn how to make money for me. But I ended up uh, at this great company called Victolic. Phenomenal organization, 100-year-old manufacturer in the, the mechanical construction industry space. Sold mechanical piping systems to large contractors. Any big tower or high rise or anything like that that's going on in your, your city, probably people are trying to figure out how to put pipe together inside of it. And that's what we sold. So I ended up 2012, taking over a team in Victaulic, led Oregon, uh, Washington, and Alaska, had 16 direct reports at 28 years old. And that is kind of what led me to the, the business that I create today. But it really did start in high school. I got a young beginning to investigating these concepts of business and how do you lead people and how do you communicate through it and how do you sell? What's a value proposition? And you know, followed that through a college pro and then in a few a number of years as a sales professional. So that's the short version of it. I'll pause there in case there's anything meaty to dive into. And then I'm happy to tell the tale once I got to Victaulic, but that's the origin story. Yeah, I love that, Eric. I do want to pile on right here in your story because I relate to it having started my first business when I was 19. And I feel like because we got those young starts, Eric, and by the way, I was in BPA, which was the the rival to DECA. So we saw all you DECA kids at the national conventions. We were like, what's DECA? BPA is way cooler with a way more appropriate acronym, by the way, Business Professionals of America. (laughs) So on that note, though, I feel like because we started so young, it's easy for people, I'm sure you get this all the time, to look at our entrepreneurial journeys 
excuses and say, oh, well, that's natural. These things come natural to you. But it's because mm. you and I were doing it from such a young age that it looks natural, but it's it's things that we grew into. It's things we learned along the way with a lot of scars and, and failures and ups and downs along the way. So I think that with that in mind, it's so fascinating to me. And I want you to tell that story of the question that you were asked in 2016. But it's, it's funny to me because it's such a simple question that listeners are about to hear from you, but it's also fascinating that you didn't have an answer to it. And I didn't have an answer to it for so long. And it's because we've never been forced to think about it. So walk us down that path of that realization of, holy cow, I've been doing this for so long without that intention to take a step back and assess it. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. I'm actually going to tie it back to the point you were making that we cut our teeth at a very young age and we're fortunate enough to have that exposure at that point in our lives. And I'd encourage whoever's listening to might feel that way. Like, wow, there's a head start. It's still a skill. It, t- it still took time, right? I used to talk like this and I had to be convinced and coached to pull my hand away from my mouth. So it isn't natural. I think, uh, much of business, much of leadership, much of uh, the skills you develop with the business acumen are conditioned. They're trained. And that's really good news because it doesn't mean you're born with them or born without them. It just means you can be trained and reconditioned to learn how to do those things if you so desire. You're never too late to start developing those skills. In fact, it's way easier to develop them today than it was when we were high school kids trying to figure that stuff out. So nobody's behind the eight ball in that regard. But fast forward to that question. So I set the stage a little bit, right? I I, I started this fantastic company. I joined this 100-year-old entity with a massive sales force, phenomenal organization. Ended up getting promoted at a young age, 28 years old. And I had 16 direct reports. I was the youngest and least experienced person on my team. Uh, I never sold what most of them actually sold. So you could say I had some headwinds, right? I wasn't stepping into a layup of a situation. But for the first few years, it was going okay. But what I found is over three or four years is I could produce results, but it took a lot of work. Like it was an enormous amount of effort for me to try to help my people along. I was going to their appointments and closing deals with them. I was doing the prep files and contracts for them. I was doing so much of their jobs to help them be successful. It was exhausting. I was burning out. I felt like an adult babysitter. I felt like I struggled with talent development. I had no idea what it took to actually develop people. I had so many team team members that started and had to fire or started and plateaued because I didn't know how to get into that next level. I didn't know what I was doing. And I wasn't given, to your point, any of the skill to do that, right? Like most organizations, great organizations or otherwise, they promote you and they're like, you're good at selling. You can lead people, right? And then you just put you in that position to go and do it. And And that's great. I was pretty sure they have the opportunity, but I never got any sort of training or support on how do you transfer skill and performance? How do you help people get better at their job? How do you not do their jobs for them? And that's what led me to this critical moment. See, I was trying to leave the company. I told you how great it was. Had a great setup, liked my job, but I thought I could grow more. Really, in hindsight, I was hoping the grass was greener. If I'm super honest about it, I had all these problems I didn't know what to do with. And I thought if I went over there, I wouldn't have them anymore. So I was trying to leave. And I was interviewing for this other company. I was sitting at the final interview with the CEO and he asked me that simple question. The one that's led to the entire creation of my business, the framework for everything that I do. And that simple question was, how do you hold your people accountable? I'm going to restate it because it's a pretty profound but simple question. How do you hold your people accountable? And the CEO, this, this wizened veteran in his business asked me that simple question. And it crushed me. At that point, I was like 32, 33 years old. And I convinced myself I was good at this, right? We'd have all been through imposter syndrome. I was past that. I was good at this. My boss thought I was good at it. My team may or may may not have, but other people did. I I thought I was good at this. And he asked me this one question. It absolutely swept the legs out from underneath me because in that one moment, I realized, oh shit, pardon it, but oh shit, I I don't have a clue how to answer this question. I don't actually know what I do or say When somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to, does it later, does it poorly. And I could reflect on my salespeople giving me all the excuses and, oh, that was a weird situation or they're going to use the other guy or we're too high or all of the things I heard from my people were running through my head and I realized, oh my gosh, when they say those things, I don't know what to do. So I came back from that interview absolutely haunted. I felt so inauthentic. I felt like a fraud, a lost little boy who had to put on a suit every day and pretend again. But it sent me on a mission to start to figure out how do people hold each other accountable. So I started asking other leaders. I asked my boss, 
I asked any business leader I knew. I was fortunate to know a lot of the business owners and leaders in our, in our network uh, for our profession. And so I was able to ask a lot of people, how do you hold people accountable? And what I saw tipped me off to the business opportunity. It's not so much what I heard, though what I heard mattered, but what I saw was the biggest tip. Because most people, Brian, when you ask them, hey, how do you hold your people accountable? They go like this. I know maybe not everybody can see it, but I'm shirking. I'm shrinking away, kind of clenching my abs, protecting myself with my fists. We don't like this question. And I witnessed it again and again and again over a cup of coffee or a beer or a walk in the park. People would run from even the question, how do you hold your people accountable? And what they would say were the same things that I had said. I made up an answer when I was asked. I said, I've got good incentive plans. My people should be motivated. And I said, I've got good systems and processes and softwares and KPIs for reporting so I can know when people aren't accountable. But I had no idea what I actually said or did in that moment. And that's what tipped me off. Oh, maybe there's something else here. But I had to start digging into that and building a framework for it. And so over the course of about three or four years, between 2016 and 2019, I started trying to answer that question with my people. I had a coach. I worked with my coach a little bit. He, he didn't have very much. He had one paragraph in his book. As I mentioned, I asked my boss. You want to know what my boss's answer was? I don't mean to throw anybody under the bus, but it's such a hilarious answer. I have to use it. I asked him, hey, how do you hold people accountable? And mind you, this was a word he used all the time. Like, that company loves the word accountable. So I thought if I ask anybody, the person who uses this word the most should know it. How do you do it? And the answer that he gave me was, well, you got to measure where they are and tell them where you're trying to get them and then hold them accountable to getting there. That was his definition for how to hold somebody accountable. Needless to say, it wasn't very helpful. That circular reasoning. Nobody had a good answer. And so I started trying different things. And over the course of that three or four years, I ended up building out an entire program. I'll tell you briefly about it. And then I want to make sure it's more back and forth than just me, Brian. But what I learned was there is a helpful way to hold people accountable. It can be productive and positive, And I can share with people how to do that. I have a very clear answer for it today. But I also learned that it's really important to set expectations well. That most of the time when I was disappointed in somebody's performance, I owned a piece of that by making sure, excuse me, by having set poor expectations, making a bunch of assumptions or using the same words, but meaning different things. And therefore they were set up for failure from the very beginning. So you set expectations then you hold somebody accountable. What about that doesn't work? Well, what I learned was that a lot of people don't like accountability because it feels negative. It's scary. It's tense. In fact, a lot of people today, especially if they're younger, accountability is a four-letter word. You better be careful that day you go throwing that accountability word around in your office. They never heard it before. You might scare some folks. So we had to decouple conflict from accountability. Accountability is a very healthy, positive thing. Accountability is your basketball coach making you show up at 6 a.m. in the next week to shoot free throws because you shot four from 10 from the line and that's why the team lost the game. He may be making you do something, but it's intended to make you better. It's intended to help you grow, to perform better in the future with something you're clearly committed to because you're on the team playing basketball. That's accountability. It doesn't have to be negative. It should be a positive, healthy thing. Conflict is a different story can share more about the difference there, but we needed a different tool when somebody got to conflict where they'd repeatedly or egregiously violated my expectations. That's a different story. And we needed to decouple those and have different tools that people could use. Because you set expectations, you hold people accountable, you have conflict if accountability doesn't work. But I don't know conflict doesn't work. I don't know when you got someone who's become a toxin or a cancer or someone who's negative on your team. You need to be able to turn that person around or separate from them with confidence. And you'll be able to move quickly through that process. So I built out an entire framework for this. I had to live through all of that with my team. I had 16 people. I had to live through all of these phases. And one last piece that I learned is it's a lot easier to do this if you're working on building and restoring trust all the time. And if you have a deep-rooted understanding of their motivations and how they align with the companies. So I ended up building a curriculum that had all five of those pillars. In 2020, I ran 30 leaders at the company through it. I learned that other people could do it. It wasn't me or my people. We weren't special. And that's when I knew I could leave and actually start this as a business. Yeah, gosh, I love that story. And I love that overview so much, Eric. But I also know along the way that you are so intentional with the words that you choose. And what really stands out to me, just hearing the way you talk about this story and hearing the way that you set out to develop your framework, which I'm a big fan of frameworks, because it's something we can all lean on. Frameworks are strong. You said the word systems, for example, I think that a framework is a really sound system that we can turn to in the moments where we need it in the moments where everything else flies out the way 
window, that's where a framework holds strong. So I really love that, what you've built there and the research that went into it. But what stands out for me about the way that you talk about it is you constantly go back to what do I do or what do I say? And I think it's so interesting thinking about those two spheres of influence that we can use with our people, with our teams, with ourselves, with people who we care about is both doing and saying. And I also know that because you're so intentional with words, heck, it's right in the name of of your entire system, which is the language of leadership. Where do you fall in that spectrum? What are the things that we, is it doing or is it saying? Oh, it's both. But I think a lot of times people say the best way to lead is to lead by example. And I don't think that's bad, but when you lead by example, what you're really doing is demonstrating a higher level of commitment and showing people what's possible. Both of those things are really important. Don't get me wrong. I think that's healthy and helpful, but to lead, to lead the definition of leadership, to lead someone is to influence them towards advantage. That's what we're trying to do. You're trying to get somebody to do something they wouldn't have otherwise. That means you're the proximal cause of their change. They wouldn't have done it without you. That's what it means to lead somebody. Otherwise, you're just letting them do their thing, which is okay sometimes, but you're not leading in those moments. And well, what do you do to influence somebody? How do you actually do that? And you got to talk to them or write it in Slack or email or text. Don't get me wrong. There's multiple channels for this and we have to think through it a little carefully, but that's what you do. We communicate to lead other people. So yeah, I'm very selective about the words that we use because you know, I spent, again, I came, out, I came up in sales. You learned this in BPA, just like I did in Deco. What you say matters. There's a spectrum of what you can say before you win a deal or lose a deal. And you start doing more and more and more if you build sales teams and sales processes at refining what you say and how you say it so that it lands with people. Well, we don't do any of that when we lead. You know, we would spend hours building pitch books and processes and thinking through our discovery questions for our sales process. And then I'd spend two minutes maybe preparing for my one-on-one with my person on my team. Like We're willing to spend the appropriate amount of time thinking through our message to our clients but we won't do it with our own people. Like that's odd to me. That struck me as odd. And I started realizing I didn't want to do other people's jobs for them anymore. I was tired of flying to Anchorage or Fairbanks or Seattle to close deals because they needed me there. No, they didn't. These are professionals. Close the deal, man. So I had to start being very careful about what words I used to help that person prepare to become good enough to close the deal on their own. So I didn't have to fly there anymore. I had young kids. I didn't want to do that anymore. So what you say matters, how you say it, arguably matters more. We've all heard this before. It's not what you said. It's how you said it. Well, that's super true. If I start a conversation with you and I say something along the lines of, Hey, Brian, what I really want is for you to have a long conversation here, or excuse me, a long career here. And look, I've seen a couple things that I think are going to get in your way. I'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and share those with you. Could I share those with you at some point? That's a very different statement than, Hey, Brian, what I really want is for you to have a long career here. And I got to tell you, there's a couple things that are really getting in the way. I'd like to share those with you. Could I do that? There's a subtle difference in there. Sure, I threw in a cup of coffee in the first one. But my point is upward tones, volume, body language, those communicate things to people subconsciously. And as leaders, we often communicate to people unintentionally our frustration or anger. We're in the middle of a frustrating situation with them. And so our body language and tonality and volume and harsh enunciation of consonants conveys a lot to them. And that usually sets them up to be defensive, dodgy. All they're trying to do is get out of the way. Not ba- and that's when you start to hear excuses. All those things happen because of how you said the thing, not necessarily what specifically you said. So the language of leadership is all about that. How and what do I say in these moments? Because that's what's going to influence somebody towards an advantage for themselves, for the company, whatever it is. And the last piece I'll add is you mentioned this as a, a critical piece of it. When things really hit the fan, when it's messy, sometimes people say, oh, I rise to the occasion. Well, I hate to say it. No, you don't. Absolutely nobody does. There's a reason that NFL quarterbacks and teams spend hours and days before every game practicing for that fourth quarter play they might need to run in the Super Bowl. It's because in moments of stress, we don't rise to the occasion. We actually regress to our highest level of training. And so the programs that I deploy with teams is to help them practice, rehearse, train for these tense moments so that when it arises, you can say it with the right tone, body language, etc., and you'll have the right words because you've done it so many times. It'll just become muscle memory. But that's where I fall on that spectrum. What you say matters, how you say it matters more, and we need a system and a framework to practice so that we can effective, effectively deliver it in, in times of stress and struggle. 
gosh, Eric, raising the bar. Honestly, all of this stuff is what we're really tying this into is incredibly high standards for ourselves, for our businesses, for the teams that we run, which in turn means that we're going to deliver better things for our clients, which for me, I believe that entrepreneurship changes the world. And I think that this makes us all better business leaders, which makes the world a better place. So I love these higher standards. And I also know, actually, I'm going to make a quick aside before I could ask you a million questions, because there's so much good stuff that we're, we're diving into. Eric, I know that listeners are going to be like, Brian, what's the answer to the question? How do you hold people accountable? <laughs> we have to go back there, Eric, before people tune yeah. out of this. So t- take us down that road, especially since we all know that you didn't have an answer. A lot of us wouldn't have an answer. You transparently called it out. You made something up. And I think most of us would in that moment. So give us a better answer. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Man, if I could go back to that job interview, I'd crush it this time. I know exactly how to answer that question. But we have to go backwards before we can go forwards here a little bit, okay? The definition of accountability that most people walk around with, whether you've ever thought about it or not, how would you know accountability in the wild if you saw it? Well, most of the time, we tend to think that an accountable person does what they say they're going to do. That's our usual active definition of accountability. And that's what we're expecting of people that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Except what about when they don't? When they don't, if that's our definition, we're kind of handcuffed and, and we tend to use the tools that have been used on us. I don't know about you, Brian, but the tools that were used on me growing up and through other years in my career were guilt, shame, negativity, the doghouse avoidance. So if somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to, we tend to use the tools of the people who use them on us and tried to hold us accountable in those ways. And that's why we have this negative culture of accountability. So the change that I had to make, the fundamental change that I made to help us understand what we do to hold someone accountable starts by expanding our definition of accountability. See, I too think that an accountable person does what they say they're going to do, except I know people are going to fail quite often. And it's not necessarily because they're not the right person or I made a bad hire or whatever. It's because we put them in complex situations. If it was easy, we wouldn't pay them very much or we'd start using chat GPT or something to do it. Like they're going to fail because that's why they have jobs because it's hard. It's difficult. It's challenging. And they have complex lives. Throw in remote work, COVID, all those things. Complexity abounds. People are going to fail. And it's what they do when they fail that makes somebody accountable or not, in my opinion. So I'd expand my definition and here's what it is. I think an accountable person does what they say they're going to do, except when they can't. That person proactively communicates it to stakeholders self-diagnoses the nature of the miss or the failure and solves for the future. That's full accountability. That's what I expect from people. And if somebody takes a second and internalizes that while you're listening to this, it might look like you. You might naturally do a lot of that. I'm not saying you're perfect either. I'm just saying you might naturally do some of those things. And you might think about your team and go, yeah, a small percentage of my people, I've learned it's about 15% of people, do this automatically. I don't know why but they do. I don't need to get into nature or nurture. They just do. And it's weird to those of us who do that other people don't. That's what creates a lot of workplace tension and frustration is the assumption that everybody works that way. So we had to expand our definition. That's what I think an accountable person does. They go through this sequential process. That's what accountability is. It's a sequential process. Did you do the thing you were supposed to? No. Okay. Did you tell the person ahead of time that you weren't going to be able to? What caused the failure And what are you going to do next time? We ask those questions internally in order to be more accountable for the future. So to hold somebody accountable now, now that we know what the definition is, to hold someone accountable is to make them live through that process. To ask them a series of questions each and every time they don't do it, do it late, or do it poorly. Those are the only three ways for someone to not be accountable. Anytime somebody doesn't do it, does it late, or does it poorly, I'm going to ask them a series of five questions in the same order each and every time. And because I do that, a few things are going to happen. The first thing that's going to happen is they're going to know it's coming. Right now, listeners, you have people in your organization you're adapting to. You've got a character. I'm not going to name him. I usually have names for them, but broad audience. I'm not going to name it, but you have a character. You know this person's name that when you assign something, you 100% know you're not going to get it the day it's due. They're going to do it. And the quality is going to be really good, but you don't know when you're going to get it. And man, if you go ask them the day it's due, they're going to give you every excuse under the sun and I need more time and all that stuff's going to happen. So you don't even ask anymore. You've been conditioned and you've conditioned them that it's completely fine for them to take 48 more hours. 
So the first thing that happens when you start holding people accountable consistently with the same questions is they know it's coming and they adapt their behavior to you instead of you conditioning them that they're special and get 48 extra hours on every assignment. That's the first benefit. The second is that you're asking questions that help them level up their skill and their commitment. That's what leads to performance. Skill plus commitment equals performance. So every time they fail, I'm going to make a person dig in a little bit. What is it that caused you to miss here? I'm not going to say it that way. I can demonstrate that in a second. But what caused them to miss? And when did they know they weren't going to be successful? Those are two critical factors that determine their skill and their commitment to success. I'm going to help them investigate that using proper tone and everything to help them have a real conversation as opposed to shutting them down so that they level up their skill and their commitment each time. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reassign the work back to them because it's their freaking job and it's not mine. And now that I've talked to their skill and their commitment level challenges and I've helped them level up a little bit, I'm going to reassign it back to them and make them push it across the finish line themselves. There's times when you can't. I respect that. I run a business too. We got hard deadlines. But whenever possible, I'm going to make an adult come face to face with the consequences of their own failure, which means they might have to open their laptop at night instead of me. They might have to spend the time finishing that report or redoing it or something before the board meeting instead of me doing it over the weekend. That's what it means to hold someone accountable. That was a long-winded version, the short-winded version. To hold somebody accountable is to ask them a series of questions each and every time they fail so that they get better and finish the job themselves and that they are more accountable in the future. Yeah, gosh, Eric, you say it's a long winded answer, but it gives us so many unique insights that this next question is not even going to be a question. I feel weird even airing this, but I trust you fully that you're going to give us some additional insights here because hearing you talk about this. Obviously, for me as a business owner with a growing team across a portfolio of businesses that I have, I love being a better leader. And it's something that I've become more committed to over the years because when I was 19, gosh, I was just trying to keep myself in check. Like that was all I had to worry about. And so the older that I get, the more responsible that I get for other people's livelihoods and and for their well-being financially, mentally, professional, career development, skill-wise, all of those things. It really makes me realize that there's so much that goes into this. And, And while we're all also managing all of this, Eric, we're also still managing ourselves. And I can't help but think to this clip that I saw of Kobe Bryant. I'm a Boston Celtics fan. I'm originally from Boston, but I got to shout out Kobe here because I remember he was on a TV show once and the host asked him, Kobe, how do you train like such a beast in the off season? What is it about you that doesn't fail? Because here we are, Eric, we're talking about failure, letting ourselves down, letting our teams down. And Kobe had such a profound answer that I try to live up to this standard. And I'm curious how it fits in with the way that you think about accountability, whether it's of others or ourselves. Kobe said, I've already signed the contract. I don't negotiate with myself. When I set out, once the season ends, I've signed a contract saying, this is what I'm doing this summer and I will not negotiate. Because Eric, when I was an immature entrepreneur, when I was 19, 20, 21 and figuring things out, I constantly negotiated with myself. And when those deadlines came up, I was like, well, it's okay if I put it off tomorrow because it was okay, quote unquote. So it's that self-negotiation that I've been thinking about so much lately for myself and my teams. Give us some insights here because I feel like that's one of the ways we let ourselves and our teams down. Yeah, great, great perspective. And it's a natural reaction to this conversation to get self-reflective, right? Because in the moment of trying to hold somebody accountable, one of the conversations we catastrophize in our head is, oh God, what if they call me out too? Because I'm not perfect, right? I should be held accountable to some things. I screw up. I fit into that category of complex life. I'm going to fail too. So we have to go and kind of prepare to expect that a little bit. And there's a whole ebook that I wrote called The Big Four Excuses. It helps us navigate how some of those uh, come up. We can talk about it if you'd like to. But I'm a big fan of that don't negotiate with yourself mentality for yourself. In fact, the way that I like to think about it, I I didn't write this myself. It came out of an awesome book called Freed to Lead. But it's that uh, discretion is a cage with velvet bars. We think we're freed because we can make more choices when in reality, if we just like Kobe... Mamba mentality say, nope, this is happening. I'm not negotiating with myself about this process or thing that I'm going to do. Well, we get a lot more done and we spend a lot less time debating or talking ourselves out of things. Now, that's for me. That's my internal bar. I have zero expectations that other people live that way. I would like them to. I think it's healthier. I think it's better, but I'm not here to cast my morality or my structure on someone else's lives. In fact, I'm very happy to employ people 
as an employee, a vendor, a contractor, whatever it is, who have wildly different views on this. That's completely fine to me. However, in the moment when they were supposed to do the thing they were supposed to do, my first question is going to check in on this. So let's just say you didn't do what you were supposed to. Let's go to, let's go to the mom mentality, right? And skips a workout. My very first question to a person who skips a workout that they've committed to, and I want you to understand that's a really critical point. They committed to it. If we go back to our definition of accountability, it's people who do what they say they're going to do, not what they heard they're going to do. This is a critical failure most leaders make because they tell people what to do instead of getting the people to tell them what they're going to do. We validate back to people what they're going to do instead of making people validate back to us. But if they said it to me, I can hold them accountable to it now. And my very first question to that person, if it's, let's say it's that workout example, my very first question is, hey, when did you realize you weren't going to get that workout in? That's the first question after I asked them, hey, did you get the workout in? That's the first question. The second is, no, I didn't get it in. When did you realize you weren't going to get that workout in? And what they say matters. Because if I can help that person level up that mentality, that Mamba mentality, that's the commitment piece I'm talking about. And they say, you know, I, I, I knew last night I was going to set my alarm and not wake up to it. Well, okay. I can help them think through that a little bit. What might you need to do to take your alarm seriously? Or don't set your alarm. Quit lying to yourself. I don't know. Whatever the right guidance is there. Or they might say, you know, I woke up that morning and uh, I went to put on my running shoes and I just didn't have it. I quit then. Well, whether you quit the night before or whether you quit the morning of or whether you quit once you got to the gym, that matters. And I can help you level up in that process so that your commitment level is higher next time. But that's why these questions are so important. It's not, it's not why did you fail? That's not a very effective question. When did you realize you weren't going to follow through on your workout this morning? The second question would then be, well, what do you think really caused that to happen? Because then I can help the person think through, oh, I need to prep my shoes the night before. Oh, I need to give myself 15 more minutes in the alarm. Or, oh, I need to pre-design my workout the night before so that when I show up to the gym, I know what I'm going to do. Those are all skill things. I can help them level up their skill in that moment. And then I can help them solve for the future. Now that we've talked through that, and you know you need to set your alarm differently and build the workout the day before, what can you do next time? What are you going to do for your next workout? How do you make sure you apply this to the next opportunity? And I'm going to make them come up with their own plan. Well, Tuesday is my next workout. I'm going to design it on Tuesday afternoon. It's in my calendar at 3 o'clock now. And I'm going to set my alarm for 4.45 instead of 5 so that I have 15 more minutes. Hot dang. I just helped that person level up their skill and their commitment. And since they told me what they're going to do differently, I can now hold them accountable to it. That's the process of holding somebody accountable. That's how it applies. But I, I want to draw back to your distinction. Internal, don't negotiate with yourself. Big fan of that mentality for me. But I don't expect or even need that from my employees, contractors, vendors, bosses, whatever. I just need to know what they are committed to. If they tell me, now I can follow this process with them. Whether I think they should be committed to more or not is a different skill we teach in the academy and in the course as well. But that's not necessarily required for me to agree with what they committed to. I just need them to commit to it. Yeah, gosh, Eric, again, it's it's raising the bar. This is going to be like the three words. When I think of Eric Berglund, it's going to be raising the bar because even hearing It'd you talk worse. about, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> even hearing you talk about that missed workout, like you make me feel bad for myself about all the things that I've not followed through with. But then you ease that pain because it's, it's funny. People can criticize and we all get criticized on a daily basis for a million different things. People just as entrepreneurs, we put ourselves out there and it's easy to, to poke at us and different ways. Yeah. But I think the thing that as I've matured as a person and as an entrepreneur, what I've really realized is that there's people who poke in a different way, who poke not to criticize and not to be, you know, a hater. We've got well-wishing haters that are worried for us and scared for us and all those different things. But actually, this is genuinely, Eric, when you talk about missing that workout, it is because I want to see you succeed, because I want you to be better and do better in the future. And I think that's such an important distinction. There's a million more ways that we we could go into this. Listeners, I'm going to throw this out there for you all. Eric doesn't know this just yet, but we are going to be inviting him back for an Action Saturday episode. So if you want more Eric, you're going to get more of that. But Eric, I can't let you go here today without talking about those excuses. You alluded to it in your ebook, and I want you to talk about how listeners can get their hands on that. But the big four excuses, why is it that we fail? You've asked a lot of people that series of questions. What are some of those? And knowing that you think in terms of frameworks, what are those common things where we let ourselves down? Yeah, great question. So I want to go back a second because it's important to note, and those accountability questions that I just emulated in this hypothetical workout example, how I ask those questions matters a lot. 
there's a big difference between Brian, when did you realize you weren't going to be able to make that workout yesterday? Well, that's a fairly aggressive way for me to say it. You can't see me, but my body language, I leaned in. I'm harshly enunciating my consonants, right? I'm telling you something without telling you it by doing it that way. Instead, hey, Brian, when did you realize you weren't going to be able to get that one done, man? I'm going to interject here, Eric, because listeners can't see you like I can. Listeners, I feel like Eric is so disappointed with me in that first question, Mm -hmm. whereas the second way that he asks it, it feels like he's there with me, that he's a teammate and he's encouraging me. So yeah, it's even in the shape of your eyes, Eric, the way everything about the way you deliver it matters. So yeah, carry it on for listeners who may not be able to see. For sure. And the the difference is I'm earnestly interested in that. Like I'm curious and I can even empathize more. Hey, dude, I give me some of my workouts. I get it, man. Like that happens. But hey, when did you know you weren't going to be able to make this one? I can casual it up a bunch of different ways, make it look, sound and feel like you. You know, I do this all over the country. There's different ways people in the Northeast talk kindly to each other and the way we talk kindly to each other on the West Coast. Midwesterners are the same. There's different dialects and lingo that you use with people. What I practice with leaders in my academy is how to make it there. So it looks and sounds and feels their way. But if you notice the distinction, the intensity of me asking it directly with loud tones, higher volume, downward tones, as opposed to upward tones... Well, that matters. Not one's not necessarily right more than the other. It's relational. It's subjective to the individual. Some people, you need to come at them with high energy and high intensity. Others, you really have to be a little softer with in order for them to be able to play along in the sandbox and learn something through this experience. So being intentional about tonality is what I teach more than any one specific tone that somebody might need to adopt. So it's an important distinction because you can hear those questions and think that the magic is saying those words. And it kind of is but it's saying them in a way the other person will hear and respond to that helps them level up and get better so that they fail less in the future. And that's what I'm most interested in with that person. Now, to the excuses question, look, the inevitable outcome of this, the, the, in fact, some of you listening have already started catastrophizing this in your brain or mentally wargaming this, giving away free mental rent to your person as you think, man, if I asked my person that, here's what they would say. You already know because you've lived through it. Well, I lived through it too. And I've coached hundreds of leaders through this process now. And what I learned in listening to all of the leaders' stories of implementing this language is that you deal with excuses. And I did too. And you want to know what the weirdest thing is? The excuses I heard leading a team of outbound sales professionals in the Pacific Northwest are the exact same excuses as I heard from IT workers in Chicago and welders in the Dakotas and educators in Florida. I've had people from every path, vertical, industry, seniority level in my course and curriculum and academy, and all of them hear the same excuses. So I wrote this ebook. It's on my website. It's free. I'd love for you to to check it out. It's gotten great feedback so far. There's only four excuses in the world. Every single excuse you've heard boils into these four. And this is really important because if we think back to frameworks, if we think back to the reality of developing skill, what you can do as a leader, you can adapt to four excuses. You can have a play for four. You can't have a play for 40. That's too much. No one's smart enough or capable enough to do that, but you can have a play for four. That's what the ebook lays out. There's a very simple four-step play to handle any of those four excuses. The first thing we do is identify what exactly we're dealing with. The second thing we do is we avoid the bait The every excuse has bait on it. And sometimes it's juicy and real and truthful bait. And that's what makes it so easy to swallow. But if you swallow that bait, you're going to let that person hijack the conversation. That's what excuses are designed to do, to hijack the conversation. But if you can identify it ahead of time, you can avoid the bait. You can directly address that particular excuse and redirect it into something more and more helpful. So I'll give you the four excuses here. Then I'll talk you through that real quick. The four excuses are this. Number one, it's not my fault. You've all heard this in different variations. Get that person was supposed to do that. I didn't get it from the contractor. The vendor never got me this. Bob never did that thing. That's a very common one. We tend to hear it in those ways. The second one is I didn't know. Oh, I wasn't aware I was supposed to do that. You might have a banner in front of the person's desk that lays out their SOP or process and somehow people will still find a way to tell you they didn't know they were supposed to do it. This happens all the time. The third one 
is I'm on it now. This is rapid agreement. This isn't, it doesn't feel like an excuse. That's what makes the bait so juicy. It feels like this person's giving you everything you wanted. And what they're really saying is, well, Brian, I'm so sorry. That'll never happen again. I'll totally go do it differently now. And it's designed to get you to say, okay, that'd be great. Thanks. And not talk about it anymore. But the reality is if that person knew how to do it differently, they probably would have. People very rarely maliciously fail or forget things. So they probably don't know how or have a good process to remind themselves. So we can't take that bait. And the last excuse is that's not normal. This is a person telling you, ah, it's a one-off or I was a super weird client or that was just a weird week for me. This is a person trying to convince you that the thing you're sharing with them doesn't fit. It's not real. It's not accurate. It shouldn't be counted in that way. All four of those are the excuses that you hear. And I would challenge anybody, shoot a message to Brian, myself, whatever it is. If you've got a different one, hit me with it. I I want to find the fifth excuse, but I haven't found one yet. The one that I thought was the fifth excuse for about a month or two, as I heard it from a client for the first time back in Q3, Q4 of last year, was I don't trust you. Something to the effect of, I don't trust you or feel safe in this conversation. And for a while, I thought, you know, that's... That's absolutely designed to hijack the conversation. This fits the the model of an excuse. But then I started realizing that that's just an, it's not my fault, it's yours. That's, it's not my fault, but they're pointing it right back at you saying it's your fault that I don't trust you in this way. So our, our direct approach to that works. Now, I can't go through all four of those right now, but let me give you a simple example of how you handle these excuses. If a person's coming at me with, oh, that's not my fault, Eric, that guy was supposed to do that thing. I'm going to retort with something like, again, it's contextual, relational, geographic, lingo, all that stuff, but something along the lines of, hey, look, I got to tell you, man, there's a lot of stuff in our business that isn't our fault, but it's still our responsibility. And I get it. My client's kind of been a jerk. He hasn't been getting stuff to us, but look, it's still our responsibility. What are you going to do next time to make sure you get that thing on time from him? Or how are you going to go get that from him today so that we don't miss this deadline that we have to go hit? So I'm going to acknowledge that there is truth to this. There's a lot of stuff that's not our fault in reality. And part of being a mature adult, a business owner, a leader is still taking responsibility for it. So I'm going to confront them, address them with a hard truth like that. And I can ramp it up or down in intensity. I can add tone and volume and all sorts of things to make that person shrink or lean in. And as long as I do that intentionally, I can steer that person into a more productive conversation about how they're never going to fail this way again without having to actually say it that way. So that's excuses. Everybody leans into them. When you start holding people accountable, the most inevitable thing that's going to happen, someone's going to throw one of these excuses at you. But if you know there's only four and you can have that little cheat sheet that I put in the ebook pulled up, well, you can navigate that far more productively. And I've had plenty of clients who share with me, once you start using this, you know what happens? Your people make less excuses. Going back to that conditioning word, once they know that Eric doesn't swallow that it's not my fault anymore. Once they hear, there's a lot of stuff that's not our fault, but it's still our responsibility. How are we going to get it done together, man? Once they hear that two, three times, some people are a little slower on the uptake. I respect that. But most people are going to stop using that excuse. And that means what they're going to do is something different. Maybe it's a different excuse, but maybe just maybe they'll actually have taken responsibility and accomplished the thing or come to you seeking help ahead of time. And both of those are wins. So that's the playbook for excuses. Do you, again, you run a growing business, Brian. Which one of those do you hear most commonly in your world? You don't have to throw it a bit under the bus publicly, but what one jumps out at you as I listed them off? Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's funny because it's not just internally with teams, but I'm also going to throw clients in here. So it could be anyone in my ecosystem, but it is for sure that one of, oh, it's not my fault. It's, it's just that lack of, and it's funny because to me, that's the most traditional use of how I talk about a lack of accountability is it's not my fault. It's yours. And, and you're right. It's that, that very simple line that you just looks like you just pull it out of your back pocket. It's always ready right there, which is, well, yeah, maybe it's not your fault, but it's your responsibility that I think as someone who grew up, soccer was a big part of my life, being a team captain. Like I learned as a captain, gosh, the coach would always say to me like, hey, why are these kids late to practice? And it's like, I wasn't late. It's them that was late, but yeah. it's like- my okay. mom was late. I don't know. It's not my fault, dude. <laughs> yeah. And so I think it's such an important aspect of, of accountability that, yeah, it is. It's who cares whose fault it is? Like, let's take responsibility for it and move forward together. So I love those perspectives, Eric. I'll tell you what, a lot of listeners are going to say, I want more 
Eric, and, and they're going to know as well as I do that we're running out of time here today. There's only so much we can cover, but listeners, that's why Eric has all of these resources, his free ebook. We're going to drop that link on you in just a second. His Academy, the language of leadership system. You are able to get inside of all of this stuff. Eric's knowledge is not confined to a 40 minute podcast episode. So we'll talk about all that in a second, but Eric, it is tradition here on the show. I always ask my guests, what's that one takeaway you want for listeners from today's session? We talked about so many things. It's for sure going down as one of my favorite episodes in podcast history. I've never said that on the air. You're the first time I've ever confessed that here on the air. 800 plus episodes. But with that in mind, Eric, what's that one takeaway? What do you want everyone to walk away from today's session and say, you know what, I'm going to start doing or thinking about this one thing? Well, I'm I'm bad at following instructions and that's why I'm a good entrepreneur. So I'm actually going to give you two. Sorry. I just think it's too important. Number one, most valuable takeaway. You heard me say one thing today. Get your people to tell you what they're going to do. Stop telling them what they need to do. You might need to help them learn how to do it or tell them what the steps are to do it or tell them when the boss needs it or whatever it is. But until they say it back to you, it's not real. You can't hold them accountable to You have no idea what they heard. And that will be the most subtle and most powerful change you could possibly make taking coming out of today. So that's number one. Number two, leadership is a skill. That's great news because that means you can practice it to get better. You are not born an awesome leader or a terrible leader. You can lead from any position in the building. You can lead in 360 degrees, your bosses, your peers, your peers, employees, your board. You can hold people accountable in 360 degrees in your life if you have the right amount of skill. And that's what my entire business does. It helps leaders not just know things. Knowledge is cool, but look, knowledge is free. You can get it on iPhone and chat GPT and Google and YouTube all you want. Skill is what's going to get you that 360 degrees of accountability in that next level in life. So takeaway number one, get them to tell you what they're going to do. It'll make your life so much easier and they'll get better at their job fast. And number two, leadership's a skill. Being able to do all of these things and do them well will be a function of how much time you'll spend practicing. So check out some of the links, resources, courses, webinars, all the things Brian's going to share. I've got a lot of opportunities for people to come develop skill with us. Boom. I love that. You're making my job easy here today, Eric. Yeah. Tease some of those links. Obviously, we're going to put them down in the show notes section, but tell listeners where they should go and why they should go there. Yeah, absolutely. So check out my website, the uh, languageofleadership.io. Know that I started to say it that way. www.languageofleadership.io. When you go there, you'll see my free course. It's the first two modules of my course called The Language of Leadership. You'll also see a paid version of the course. That's the entire five modules. The React framework is in there as I laid out expectation setting, accountability, conflict, turnaround, and trust and motivation are in what I call the rules of engagement. So you'll see an opportunity to take those and learn what tool sets are available to you. There's also a free ebook, the big four excuses. Can't recommend enough. Pull that thing out, read it once. It's like 17 pages. It'll lay out the framework for why excuses exist. You make them too, and that'll make it easier for you to handle them. And then you'll have a cheat sheet to know how to address these things and start reducing the things that they happen. But where all this meets the road is when people join the Academy. That's where people come to practice leadership. That means back to those role-playing skills that Brian and I got at a young age because we were nerdy high schoolers who didn't have better things to do apparently other than talk about and role-play through business. You can come and do that. And so every other week for an hour, people join my academy and they come to a group Zoom call. I lead them all and people practice using these skills. That means you'd role-play in a breakout room holding somebody accountable. And I promise you, it feels uncomfortable the first few times. That's why you don't do it in real life. That's why you let the person slide because it feels uncomfortable. But once you practice it a few times, once you've said it a few times and you've had me or somebody else be a little spicy or difficult back or maybe really easy depending on the person you're pretending to work with, you won't be afraid of it anymore and you'll have skill. And that skill you'll use for the rest of your career. So go to the website, check out the free course, check out the paid course, check out the ebook. But most importantly, come practice in the academy. You can check out a webinar where I'll share all of this in a slightly different format. There's a few links that you can do to register for those. We'll share all of that, but there's a plenty of, there's a plenty of resources for you to jump into and start putting to use so that you can start to hold people accountable. Yes, listeners, you already know the drill. We are dropping all of those links down below in the show notes, wherever it is that you're tuning in to today's episode. So a wealth of goodies to go in there. And as Eric said, what's better than investing in something that you will carry with you for life? It's not a thing. Gosh, as someone who doesn't like things, Eric, I love the fact that you are implanting goodness into the way that we show up in the world. So incredible resources there. Listeners, check those show notes. And Eric, on behalf of myself and all the listeners worldwide, thanks so much 
much for being so generous and insightful with all of these things you shared with us here today on the show. Thanks for having me. This has been awesome. Great questions. And I look forward to whatever this Saturday thing is with you. (laughs) 